if we fail to recognize that in every instant of life, human beings are learning, then we are misoriented to all of those aspects of how humans develop, another word for learning, grow, another word for learning, become their future selves, another word for learning. We're, we become oblivious to all of those dimensions in which a human is developing to become who they're becoming because of the way we pigeonhole learning into being about academic utilitarian stuff rather than it's also about the way they learn to relate to each other emotionally. It's also about how they learn to inhabit their bodies. It's also about how their uh, eating habits, everything's learned. And the more that we understand that, then the more that we have an opportunity to intervene on that, to, to participate in that. And that without understanding the difference between artificial forms of learning and natural forms of learning, we cause children to shame out of learning by not contextualizing and not understanding the different kind of stairways we have to build. When it comes to facilitating artificial learning uh, challenges, that those challenges are technological, they're informational, they're human invented. And so that's the, exactly the right place to apply technology in new smart ways, which if for the, those of you that are interested, if you email me, I will send you something on a new kind of technology that, that's designed to support learning in the way that I'm talking about when it comes to learning from information, either learning to read or reading to learn, right? So <clears throat> the other side of that is that if we're not able to read how children are self-sabotaging, if we can't recognize their learning shame, how they're shaming themselves in the learning process, how they're blaming themselves in the learning process, then we're missing out on an opportunity to help them. So we have to be able to recognize that. We have to be able to create conditions in which we reframe the challenges they experience so that they're both motivated to to succeed, but they, they don't have an easy access to self-blame. If children blame themselves for their difficulties, which they do now, then they're going to shame themselves in relation to those difficulties. If they shame themselves, the, the accumulation of shame be, is a disabling factor to their ability to get better at it. So stewarding healthy learning, and this is the final kind of takeaway here as we run out of time, is about you changing how you learn so that you're paying attention to your own learning. You're paying attention to how shame is steering you, how you're avoiding things in order to avoid feeling bad. The more that you learn about that, the more that you see it in all the kids. When you recognize the difference between natural and artificial modes of learning in your actions, is that it becomes more real for you because you're paying attention to it, you'll see it for them. You'll see it in them. So I'm not talking about trying to say, I'm not trying to suggest that you should have some kind of a uh, artificial map, some kind of let's take a course together on all of this stuff. I'm trying to say, hopefully, think yourself, pay attention to yourself to your own learning, your own participation, how it is that you uh, interact with yourself and with everybody else around you and witness the uh, dimensions of learning in a new way. Witness the way that uh, shame disables learning and in that um, develop the ability to uh, recognize it by recognizing it in yourself, intervene on it in the, in the children. So, any questions about any of this stuff? Um, actually, I have a question. Um, oh, wonderful. We work with um, zero to three. So, yep. I, I feel really familiar with the natural learning. Um, we yep. talk to parents about teaching their babies to learn those things like learning how to walk, learning how to eat, learning how to do those things. We talk a lot about, like, you know, it has to be an enjoyable experience and you have to let them play and you have to let them use all of their senses. And then I know you talked about like the artificial learning happens when they go to school. So how do we bridge that gap of the like, because I feel like when they're babies, it's very easy to allow them to, to partake in natural learning. How do we bridge that gap from the natural learning they do as babies to when they have to start the artificial learning? Um, and how do we like help 
help parents from that like three to five gap to help prepare their children for that like school setting learning? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> first of all, the distinction of artificial learning isn't about school or age. It's about the kind of brain or learning challenges, right? And whether or not the kind of learning is a stretch that they're getting internal information about or whether or not they're, uh, the stretch of learning requires them to conform to external information, to external sources, right? So that's the first distinction. The second thing is, is that and, and, and this is really brought out in the Children of the Code website that I described about, about reading. Um, what we know is, is that you can do everything you want to try to pump up the, the social, emotional positivity in children before they go to school. And when they hit the wall with the artificial confusion of reading, if they don't get through it, it'll, it'll just wipe out their self-esteem. It just, just completely debilitates their sense of self and it harms themselves. And part of that is, is there's two, there's a number of factors, right? Because that's the big thing. The, the big artificial wall is the artificial code, learning to be symbolic in an abstract artificial way. And there's things that go on in the, in the home that prepare kids for that. Emotional resiliency with frustration to, and frustration tolerances with um, uh, greater d dimensions of challenge. That's a big plus to them when they get there. Um, having people uh, contextualize their experience when they start to get into trouble so they realize that's not their fault, right? That no other creatures could, could do these things and that many kids suffer with it and struggle with it and so forth. So framing the challenges to minimize the self-blame that leads to the shame, that leads to the self-disabling learning um, disabilities. Then... <clears throat> The other thing is, is that the, probably the most significant thing that this was borne out by the 30 million word study. You may have heard about the 30 million word gap. Have you guys all heard about that? The Hart Risley work? Okay. Uh, well, ba basically, uh, I'll just cut to the end of it because because of our time. They basically, kids are coming into kindergarten with a huge gap in their vocabulary. 30 million word gap is what, what where that came from. Kids that are coming out of families that are uh, highly talkative, parents that, that make their living with their mouth, talking all the time, right? Lawyers and doctors and professional people. They, they have a more natural, uh, verbally complex relationship with their children that exercises their children in terms of vocabulary and cognitive linguistic dimensions, as well as comfort with linguistic complexity that becomes a big added bonus and advantage to them when they get into school, both in terms of reading and in other dimensions. On the other hand, parents that are more taciturn, either by culture, like Native Americans, or by, for any other reasons, including mind shame, you know, being low literate or literate of, li literacy averse, or being uh, uh, less talkative or having the old adage, uh, kids should be seen but not heard. There's a lot of reasons for it. There's a lot of reasons why parents are less talkative and not talkative in the sense of uh, talking at their kids. There's studies that show the different kinds of talk that goes at kids and the different kinds of effects it has on them. But what the most important things, things parents can do at this stage to be helpful to their kids later is to engage them in elaborating, turn-taking, dialogical conversation. So not just to talk at them, but to be constantly uh, inquiring together. And when a child says something, inviting them to get more elaborate about it. Say more about that. What, what do you mean by that? I'm not sure I understand you. So that you're pulling the child into being more differentiated and more uh, expressive in more complex ways in language, right? So back to answering your question, or as best I can in our time constraint, um, <clears throat> ref reframing the challenges so that it minimizes self-blame and boosting their cognitive linguistic uh, capacities and their emotional resilience and frustration tolerance are the core components to them being successful later. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it does. 
Oh, I was weird. That's kind of what we encourage parents to do already. That's built into what we work with parents. So it's just yeah. reassuring to hear that that's what we should be doing. <laughs> Yeah, the, the other thing, the, the number one thing that I think that you can do for parents that trumps everything else is to get them to understand what we've been talking about. To stop seeing learning as one of these little compartmentalized side things. Like, you say, well, my child eats and they do this and they're playing with this and they're and then they're learning. As if learning is this one little compartmental thing that they're doing. Rather than everything they're doing, is, is involves, their learning is involved in everything they're doing. So by, by the parents recognizing that everything the child's doing is learning at all times, then and they start to pay attention to that, then they can learn how to be better stewards of that without necessarily following some kind of a model or protocol or routine. They can learn into their child's learning by recognizing that everything their child's doing is learning. I was like, yes, I really enjoyed this. I, I think it was worth the 20-minute wait. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. That's kind of you. I'm sorry about all of that. I'm glad that you stayed. Yes.